Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Steph Moran. Uh, I work for the RSPB on pesticide policy. Um, this webinar is one of a series of five, which is focusing on pesticides or rather how to reduce their use. Um, and is part of a project which is um, being run by RSPB, the Nature Friendly Farming Network, Pesticide Action Network UK and the Soil Association. Now, the other webinars that we've had so far have been quite technical and aimed at a farming audience, um, specifically looking at integrated pest management, which for those who don't know, it's the approach to managing pests, disease or um, unwanted plants or weeds where chemical pesticides are only used as a last resort, if at all. Um, and those webinars covered various different uh, ways nature can play a part in managing pests um, and all the recordings of those are available online. I'll pop a link in the chat later. Um, but this webinar this evening is a little bit different um, it is less technical um, as we want it to be accessible to anyone with an interest in the subject um, and hopefully it'll give a flavour of the types of ways that farmers are using nature to manage their farms differently and with fewer or no pesticides um, as well as some more general information about pesticides. So uh, what is a pesticide? Well um, very briefly they're chemicals used to kill unwanted insects, plants or fungi um, and are used on a wide range of different land uses, including parks and gardens, um, and of course farmland, for a variety of different purposes. Um, so today you'll hear from two different farmers, Martin and John, um, who both manage their farms with nature in mind, and they're going to share their stories with you. You'll also hear from Josie, um, who works at Pesticide Action Network UK, or PAN UK, um, who's going to share some of the wider issues around pesticides, um, and also what people can do to help in their own lives. So I will let each speaker introduce themselves properly um, as they each give their talk. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Martin Lines, who is chair of the Nature Friendly Farming Network um, and a farmer in Cambridgeshire. Over to you, Martin. Um, thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity. I'm just going to try and make sure I share my screen. Uh, um, and that should... Oh, we wanted a lot. Hang on. Uh, can you see that? Yes, thanks, Martin. Yes, that's right. Lovely. Oh, I suddenly got a password requirement. So I'm Martin Lines. Uh, I'm an arable farmer in Cambridgeshire um, and I'm the UK chair for the Nature Friendly Farming Network. Oh, what a strange logo. Let me just see if I can do that. All right. Um, so we, we're based around a 165 hectare arable Oops, farm. Sorry, um, sorry, Martin, we seem to have a strange black. Can everyone else see the strange black thing on Martin's slides? Yeah. Can you see that on yours, Martin? Just... Yeah. <laughs> now, let's just switch. That wasn't there earlier. No, it wasn't. <laughs> strange gremlin. Great. Yeah, and um, no, it's gone. Perfect. That's, that's excellent. So yeah, I'm Martin Lines. We're based around 165 hectare arable farm, um, predominantly combinable crops. So we grow wheat, barley, oilseed, rape, beans. Uh, we also do contract farming and I work for other farmers and conservationists uh, delivering the management they need. So if, as our farm, we've changed quite a lot in the last 20 years from a really intensive arable farm using lots and lots of inputs, focusing on lots of outputs uh, with all the tools that we thought we needed uh, and lots of pesticides were used on our farm. Um, so, but I'm not organic, but I do focus around what we can do. So pesticides, what are they and why do we use them? So we have a range of different pesticides um, and they all do different things. So we have the insecticides that can take away the pests and we can target individual pests. But many of those products do have a wide uh, uh, control uh, use and, and take a lot of beneficials as well. We have the herbicides that we can use in the farmland to take away the weeds in a crop. When you also use them in your gardens and on your lawns, if you have your lawn treated, so they can treat individual weeds or plants within within the plant structure. And of course, then we have our fungicides that try and control diseases within within a cropped plant if we have an outbreak of disease. Uh, we try and use uh, a fungicide and then uh, we, we just touched on um, we've already mentioned uh, IPM so we have this integrated pest management system 
And for me, I now try and use a nature-based integrated pest management, using my landscape and better soil health and the environment around me to manage the pests and problems I have on my farming system. Uh, that's not helpful. Um, so I can't see one of my things. Um, that's not helpful. So move that. Move that. Right. Uh, so nature doesn't do perfect. Uh, we must understand that nature doesn't do perfect fruit, vegetables, and other things. And as society, we've been led to understand that it must do perfect. We only want to buy perfect fruit and vegetable. It mustn't have a uh, an animal nibbled a bit of it or be misshapen. And that has led to many farmers using uh, increased amounts of pesticides to try and get perfection all the time. But if we relax and let nature do the, its best and work with nature, we can hugely reduce the inputs we need and, and manage our landscape and our food production in different ways. But we do need the support of our supply chains to recognize that the produce we produce will be different. And it will have, we can have lower limits of, of, of what we um, of pesticides on those. And it's about sharing the responsibility from the seed grown in a field. So I'm a farmer, the advice, right through to the food on the plate. And as a farmer, I want to engage with the consumer and make sure that they understand the choices they have when they're shopping and when they're eating out and the food they can buy from farmers like myself and many others that are either really reducing and, and eliminating many of the pesticide products or the organic sector where they've eliminated and, and managed them in a different way. And we really need to focus around our most harmful products because some of those products we know are causing harm to our landscape, to our biodiversity, and we have question marks around human health on, on them. But they all get regulated, so they're all meant to be safe. Farmers like myself, we went through to university and college and we were taught about production and output and increase in output. But actually the knowledge I really need now is how do I reduce or remove most of those products and the knowledge of and the confidence of doing things very differently to what I did in the past. And through the Nature Friendly Farming Network and other organizations, much of that knowledge is now being shared between farmers to give us the confidence to go further and do more. And I really want to be part of communicating an honest message to our consumer about how our food is produced, how we're importing different products with different uh, ingredients used, but how we can work to reduce the amount of pesticides we use within our landscape. So I hope this works. It's a video, it's a bit windy, but just bear with it and you'll understand what I'm trying to get across. Today I'm busy out working again. It's a field of winter beans, sown last November. Not too bad, the only downside is we've got a lot of broadleaf weeds coming. These are charlock, there's some cleavers about. Um, so we have a choice. We can come through here with a tine weeder. So if I was an organic farmer, that was the only choice I would have. And I'd come through and these would get pulled out by the tine cultivator or the majority would. And actually the winter beans would be very secure. They wouldn't get pulled out. Not great because sitting out there, you know, we've got at least two pairs of black wings sitting on the nest, and there'd be some eggs in there. Really, oh, there's one just gone up there, right in the distance. Um, really hard to try and spot them when they're sitting on eggs. So they don't want to get off, and I don't blame them. So if I come through with my time weeder, I'll destroy those. Or we come through with a herbicide. So today, we're out from the sprayer, and we can selectively, selectively take out these charlotte plants and other broadleaf weeds and leave more winter beans. It's a more expensive option, but for me, in this field, it's the right option that allows me to leave those lapwings sitting out there nesting. The herbicide that we use won't harm those lapwings. You see them floating along there. I've got crows trying to buzz around, trying to get off. So if I disturb them too much, they're going to get up and the crows can come in and take their eggs. So in different fields, we need to do different solutions and different options. It's not just black and white, this is the easy choice. And it's not just about using the chemical choice, because many times we try and use other solutions. It's about getting the best outcome from our landscape, for our wildlife and for our food. So I hope you sort of see some of the decisions I make every single day. I try and avoid the, the, the pesticide use, but for sometimes, I, as a, as a non-organic farmer, I can see a benefit to use some products in a very careful and selective way. 
And also sometimes we may see a disease or a problem within a crop. And for me, if I, sometimes if I don't treat it with a fungicide, with a uh, disease in the beans, I may not have a crop to harvest at the end. And for me, I'm really trying to balance and really remove most of what I do, but still have it there as, as a tool if the weather or the climate or something went wrong, uh, I can still do things. If the market grew and I can have that financial risk uh, balanced a bit more, I can, I can move further and faster. So for me nowadays, we want to say we're very much conventional and, and high input system. I now, you know, learning better from conservationists and other farmers, I want to deliver a habitat across my farms for insect pollinators, creepy crawlies. These little things that I know very little about many times, but I've seen huge benefits to my production system, my profitability by removing many of the harmful products and the insecticides and other things from my landscape and working more with nature. So we have an interconnected landscape of habitats around the outside. But as you see in the bottom picture, on my side, it's the left with the strips in the middle. We're putting habitats in the middle of the fields now to get the creepy crawlies and the bugs that eat my pests. We're concentrating on soil health more and making the soil and the structure more healthier so we don't get such poorly plants. So that really helps me really reduce the uh, amount of products I've used in the in the past. So we started delivering habitats across the farm. These are just some of our, our flower margins. And you might see a bottom purple picture, there's a little bee in there. So where we have these habitats across the farm, we're seeing increasing yields in our pollinating crops of beans and oilseed rape, because we have more bugs and creepy crawlies coming into the crop, but we also have more bugs and creepy crawlies coming in to eat my pests. So eight years ago, we had a crop of winter beans beside the, one of these flower margins. And the, 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 um, the gentleman that gives me the advice on what pesticides to use on the farm, my agronomist, he advised me I should use an insecticide. My father had the understanding that actually um, those black bean aphids could kill my whole crop of beans and I really should be doing it. And he was really empowering me to say, I must go out and spray. The agronomist gave me a recommendation to use a fairly strong insecticide that would have taken all those aphids away. Unfortunately, we had 10 days of wet and windy weather. I can't spray when it's wet and windy. I wouldn't want to, it's a waste of money. So actually before I, after that period, before I mixed the chemical tank up and put that uh, insecticide into the sprayer, I went to look at the beans because my father was telling me you're too late, you'd have lost your crop. What I found, well, it's full of ladybirds, hoverflies, and other creepy crawlies that were eating all the aphids. And we actually didn't bother spraying because we had all the beneficiaries because we're delivering a landscape and leaving areas for nature. And they are my reservoir of, benefic ben reservoir of beneficiaries. And now we're putting them in the middle of the field. So we haven't used insecticides on the farm. It'll be nine years this coming this, this summer. And we're constantly removing more and more and building up the confidence because I talk to other farmers of how they've found solutions and being brave enough to just to give it a go because actually the solutions are there, but it does come with some more risk for myself. So I use nature as and habitats to increase my uh, production. So this, I don't think you can just about see, it's a bit blurry on my screen. Um, so what, we had a trial here last year by the PGRO and they were monitoring Brutalid beetle that eats my, my bean crop. There's three different farms they did on. Um, one was mine. One was a farm that delivered some habitats, but still uses quite a bit of insecticide and other products. And one was a, what would be classed as an intensive farmer. On my farm, I was farm A. We only had six to 11% of Brutalid be that beetle damage. So we had hardly any damage and I haven't used insecticides. The other farms that were using insecticides we're getting up to 23 percent crop damage and when you look at the other side the biodiversity i had two-thirds more biodiversity in my landscape and in the habitats i provide on the edge and right out into the field compared with pests so it's about balancing productivity and cropping with nature and understanding the nature i need to deliver so for me i'm really trying to understand what habitats do I deliver that I need for beneficial insects? And how do I join it together? We have lots of conservation information that uh, gives me guidance around how do I deliver flower margins for pollinators and, and for flowers, 
but I need to, I'm really trying to understand how do I make that, those species really work for my landscape. But I've seen huge productivity benefits, financial benefits, but there is some, sometimes a perceived risk because we're relying on nature to come and help me out and I can't always uh, understand it, what it can offer me. So, I, so there's a bit of information about the Nature Friendly Farming Network. I thank you very much and I really look forward to questions. Wonderful, thanks so much, Martin. Um, really inspiring stuff. Um, love the video of the lapwings, obviously. Um, so yeah, that, I hope that was a really sort of useful introduction as to you know why why farmers may use pesticides, um, you know what they're used for, and some of the alternatives. Um, and so now we're going to hear from our second farmer, John Pawsey, who's a Suffolk-based farmer um, and an organic farmer. Um, so a slightly different approach to Martin, um, but still, you know, farming with the same aims. So over to you, John. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to now uh, try and share my screen. And I'm going to have to move with my finger. Um, Okay, so my name's John Pawsey. Um, can everyone see that, actually? Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can, yeah. Good. Um, so my name's John Pawsey. Um, we converted our farm to organic production in 1999. I used to do all the spraying on the farm. I was a fully qualified agronomist and um, used to do all the spraying. And increasingly, as I was using more and more different chemicals that were coming along and also just mixing all those chemicals together and sitting in my sort of hermetically sealed cab as I sort of broad spectrumly sort of sprayed the countryside, I became more and more uh, worried about what I was doing. And there was a particular moment where I was spraying and a large hare got up in front of my sprayer and started running away from the sprayer. And then it suddenly doubled back and went underneath the booms and was coated in the cocktail of pesticides that I was spraying and then sat on the edge of the field licking itself. And I began to really focus on, you know, the kind of, you know, what, what else was actually going through my fields and what else was I spraying? And Martin used a, a very interesting word that, he, that his sprays selectively take out those charlotte plants, but of course, He's spraying everything. He's spraying the soil. He's spraying the bean plants. He's also spraying the weeds. And I became really uneasy about that, um, that sort of broad spectrum approach. It wasn't targeted at all. We were actually spraying everything. We were spraying the soil. We were spraying our margins and we were spraying our hedgerows. And I felt really uneasy about that. And I'm just not bright enough to really go into research whether or not I was doing any damage or not. I just felt the easiest thing was to stop and organic farming was an option. So I've just got to scroll into the next slide. So I know this is strictly not um, a, a pesticide, uh, but we also don't use any artificial fertilizers on the farm. And artificial fertilizers also uh, are known in cases, some cases, to damage soil health. So um, how do we feed our plants? Well, um, we use um, the, uh, grazing lays, uh, areas of grass. Uh, where we graze our animals. And there's a picture in the uh, top um, right-hand side of the screen, which shows a diverse grazing lay. So there's lots of different species in there, which is not any good for building soil fertility naturally, but it's also a fantastic uh, place for pollinators. And we're not just putting this around the edges of our, our fields. These are going right across the middle of our fields, uh, creating not just margins, it's, it's, it's sort of landscape scale uh, type uh, food for pollinators and also building soil fertility. And you'll also, in the bottom picture below that, you can see uh, in between crops, we also grow lots of green manures, which also provide fantastic um, places for pollinators, but also uh, to build soil health as well. And that spade that I've sort of just put in there into a copper spelt, um, just dug up, and you can see that sort of lovely structure of the so soil with an earthworm there. And you can see the kind of natural fertility we're building without using any artificial fertilizers. Um, next slide. Um, so I would also argue that animals are a very important part of our rotation and, and building soil fertility um, because they're yeah, they're sort of, you know, they're, they're walking composters. They get all this clover and they, they munch it up and it comes out at the other end uh, like a natural compost feeding our soils. But also, again, you know, this is a huge 
habitat for pollinators as well. So we're not only building soil health, but we're also uh, feeding all those beneficial insects and some of the ones that Martin was talking about. So Martin went through the different uh, different sprays that um, he uses, um, and um, you know we don't use any chem chemicals. We haven't used any chem chemicals on the farm for twenty years. So when Martin was talking about herbicides, um, you know uh, sprays that kill weeds, we use rotations, long diverse rotations to keep on top of weeds, and and lots of different sowing dates. So. We don't let any one weed dominate on the farm. We're just always thinking creatively about our fields, what weed pressure we've got in there, and, and you know, what do we plant to try and suppress those weeds. And the, the picture on the left-hand side is a crop of spelt, which we grow quite a lot of, and it's got this lovely, great big long head that even when the leaves are sort of dying off just before harvest, these big long heads shade the ground, keeping the weeds in the bottom of the crop. And again, in the uh, top right hand side, you can see we grow quite a lot of heritage wheat. So this is wheat uh, before it was dwarfed uh, for sort of non-organic production. And it grows incredibly tall and shades lots of weeds. And in the bottom picture, you can see there's a crop of um, spring oats. And you can see um, it, we're standing in the crop having a discussion about them, but you can see the kind of dense canopy they, they provide, uh, which also helps us smother weeds. Um, you know, Martin talked, you know, about his, his decision uh, about going through that bean crop to take out the charlotte with a harrowcomb, with a, a, a weeder that would disturb uh, ground nesting birds. Well, we do use mechanical weeding. Mostly we use an inter-row hoe that hoes in between the rows of plants. But we do use those kind of weeders, but it's all about timing. So if you go early, um, uh, you uh, avoid ground nesting birds. And even if you, you do, um, uh, you know, disturb the odd um, nest, um, if you do it early enough, they generally have a second clutch. And we do um, bird surveys on our farm. And in our last survey that the Suffolk Wildlife Trust uh, did for us, uh, we had the highest population of skylarks, another ground nesting bird, on our farm in Suffolk in that year. So it's all about timing. So the second, so sorry, this actually just shows a really good example of how that sort of heritage wheat. So you can see the really tall plants on the um, on the left hand side are completely smothering weeds. And there's a modern short wheat variety on the right hand side and you can see weeds creeping through. But I think it's a really good demonstration about how you can use plant architecture to um, deal with weeds on your farm. You don't need to use herbicides. And Mart again talked about um, you know, the amount of um, uh, insects and beneficial insects he's, he's building up on the farm. And he's absolutely right. I mean, you know, we haven't sprayed um, insecticides for 20 years. And, and here is uh, exactly what was Martin was talking about. So this is a, a field of beans. And you can see, you know, you can see the sort of remnants of the black fly and the bean aphid that is sort of on the plants and there. Uh, some ladybirds and their larva just uh, having a lovely meal of those insects. Uh, out of all the chemicals um, that I don't miss on the farm, insecticides are the one that, you know, I just think most farmers can just drop. And as soon as you drop them, the quicker you're going to build up beneficials, the quicker you're going to have, you're, you're going to be able to stop using them. Uh, and Martin then talked about fungicides. Well, um, it, the difficulty we have um, is that most of the plant, the modern plant breeding that we have these days, even though um, you know some of them are more resistant to fungal diseases than others, generally they're growing, grown for farmers who are going to be spraying fungicides anyway. And so they're very poor at um, defending themselves against fungal attacks. Um, it, organically, because we're feeding our soils naturally, uh, generally our plants uh, are better at find, uh, fighting off fungal diseases than, than if they were um, uh, non-organic plants. Um, but uh, still, you know, we do have problems because of the problems with the, the breeding techniques that we use nowadays. So what we do generally, how do we get around that? Well, we plant more than one crop in the field. So if one crop like these beans you can see here, are susceptible to a disease and they die off, we plant it with the wheat. So then the wheat, uh, then we get a crop from the wheat and not from the beans and vice versa. If the wheat gets a fungal disease, then the beans possibly won't. And so it's, try, it's about mitigating risk in the field and still producing, you know, a good, healthy 
uh, yield as far as your crop is concerned, but just growing lots of plant species together. I suppose it's just like sort of mimicking mother nature by having as much diversity in every square meter of the countryside as you can. But it's another way of, of getting away from having to use these fungicides. So, so to really sort of summarize, um, it, it's, it's, there's no silver bullets in, in uh, a, a situation where you are not using any pesticides at all. You have to bring as much complexity into your system uh, as possible to try and give your uh, crops the best chance of, of yielding something. And uh, I remember a student rang me up and, and asked me, you know, as far as weed control is concerned, what is the one thing in an organic system that you have to do? And the answer is you just have to be doing everything. You have to be looking at a long rotation. You have to be looking at different sowing dates. You have to be looking at crop architecture. You have to be looking at bi-cropping, growing more than one crop in the field. You have to be doing everything. And if you do that, uh, no one thing dominates. So after 20 years of farming without pesticides, there is no one weed that is dominating on our farm. There's no one pest that is dominating on our farm. And there's no one fungal disease that's dominating either. And, you know, that comes down to this sort of complexity of, 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 of just thinking about the most complex rotation you can. You can. And, uh, and if you do that, you can get around these things. Building natural fertility uh, is incredibly important, as I think I've discussed. Uh, the fact is, if you build up health in your soil, uh, then you get better healthy plants. Um, but by building that fertility in your soil, by using uh, legumes, you've got all those, low, you know, those flowers on a landscape sort of scale across your farm uh, that are also uh, feeding pollinators as well. I've talked about using crop arch architecture. It's incredibly important to try and keep the ground covered at all times, building up those beneficial insects and being inventive uh, by using multi-species cropping. Um, you know, we're so used to looking at monocultures in fields. Um, and if the only difficulty is separating those crops after harvest, which is perfectly possible, and it's what we do, uh, then there should be more multi-species cropping in the countryside. And if you're doing all these things, you're building as much complexity into your system, you're doing absolutely everything, uh, nothing will dominate, and it is perfectly possible uh, to uh, farm successfully and profitably without using any chemicals. I think that is me done. Oh, just that's a, a crop of cheer. We grew the first organic crop of cheer in the um, in the country last year, and you can see a nice bee on there as well. They absolutely loved it. Um, so yes, go out and buy some organic cheer. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. Brilliant presentation. Um, yeah, it's just so interesting to hear kind of you know whether you're fully you know organic like John or almost organic like Martin. So many of the different techniques are you know they're so similar and we've learned so much from organic farmers over the years and those techniques just over and over again you hear that it's using nature working with nature instead of against it um so i think that's sort of a really important take home message from from both john and martin there so um slightly different um direction for the for the third speaker now um like i say remember to put questions in the chat for john or martin um if you have any um, but we're now going to hear from Josie Cohen, um, who works at Pesticide Action Network UK, um, and she's going to um, not talk so much about the, the farming side of things, but sort of other uh, aspects of pesticides um, and what people can do to help. Over to you, Josie. Thanks, Steph. I'm just going to do the scary bit of trying to share my screen. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, sorry, let me just move this thing. Display settings. Okay, I think that should be good. Is that good, Steph? I think, uh, yes, perfect, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so as Steph said, I'm Josie from the Pesticide Action Network. I'm Head of Policy and Campaigns, and I've been there for five years. Um, so Pan UK, in case you don't know us, we work to tackle the problems caused by pesticides to both the environment and human health, 
And we also conduct research and advocate for truly sustainable and healthy non-chemical alternatives in agriculture, but also in urban spaces and homes and gardens. So we straddle the line between kind of evidence-based and doing scientific research, but we also do our own campaigning for change. And we're part of a global PAN family. Um, and PAN UK actually was started in the 1980s, actually by Oxfam and the trade unions, who felt that they didn't really have the expertise to go up against the pesticide industry, the technical expertise, whether that was toxicology or agronomy. So PAN UK was sort of started as a, as a think tank, really, but we've involved, evolved into doing our own campaigning now. So it's really inspiring to hear from Martin and, and John, but I'm gonna talk about ways that those of us who don't farm can get involved in helping to drive a reduction in pesticide related harms in the UK. And um, given it's uh, the week of International Women's Day, first I wanted to introduce you to probably the woman who kicked the whole thing off, who a lot of you will know, which is Rachel Carson, uh, who's a marine, American marine biologist, author and conservationist. And in 1962, she published an amazing book called Silent Spring about the environmental um, and to some extent health impacts being driven by the use of widespread pesticides. She focused on DDT um, and her book was actually serialized in the New Yorker. And it's the 60th anniversary of the publication will be in September. So it's particularly poignant to be talking about now. And, and the book really actually is, um, is given the accolade of having kicked off the environmental movement. Um, but as well as being a scientist and an activist, Rachel Carson was also a really beautiful writer. So um, my presentation will be peppered with a few of her quotes and some might feel a bit bleak, especially considering 60 years on, you could argue that actually the environmental impacts are worse. But actually, um, right now, there is the most attention on pesticides, I would say, since 1962, certainly in, in the UK. And there is a real opportunity to create lasting change. Um, so here's just a few ways that people can get involved uh, in that. So the first thing is uh, that I'd like to talk about is our work with UK supermarkets. So we work with the UK's top 10 supermarkets. And every two years, we, we publish a public ranking. Um, and then in between rankings, we work with their technical people behind the scenes to advise them on how they can reduce pesticide related harms linked to their supply chains. So this is the 2021 ranking, as you can see, uh, some are lagging far behind others, but in general, the sector is making some progress. Um, so just a few examples of things that have happened in the last six months, both Co-op and Waitrose have ended their sale of pesticide products to, to customers. Tesco's has created its own list of highly hazardous pesticides. So pesticides that aren't allowed to be used in its supply chain. So we're creeping forward very slowly. And the way we work with supermarkets is we assess them on eight topics to do with uh, pesticide use and we assign them numbers of trolleys. So as you can see, the green is outstanding. Um, orange is making good progress. Two trolleys run red is could do better and one is lagging behind. So we rank them on what are their efforts to phase out the most hazardous pesticides. And a lot of those will look at actually chemicals that have been banned in the UK, but in use in their global supply chains. Um, what, what support are they supplying? Are they giving to their suppliers and growers to adopt non-chemical alternatives? How well are they doing in terms of reducing residues in food? What measures do they have in place to protect bees and other pollinators? How transparent are they about their pesticide use? Um, are they boosting organic sales and prioritizing organic? Are they engaging with customers on, topic that enable, on topics that enable pesticide reduction? So for example, if you co complain to a supermarket that you found a bug in your lettuce, do they write back, congratulations, that's a beneficial insect because we're using less pesticides? Or do they say, we're so sorry, it won't happen again? And are they still selling pesticide products to their customers, as I said? In terms of ways you can get involved, so there's obviously about choosing where you spend your money, where you shop, but obviously this isn't always a choice. So there's a, you know, you may have noticed that the more expensive supermarkets are doing better on this topic. So obviously affordability, particularly with the cost of living crisis means that not everybody can choose what supermarket they shop at. And also accessibility, you know, particularly in rural areas, you might only have access to one supermarket. So if you can't switch to one, to one of the supermarkets doing better, there are lots of other things you can do. So buy the wonkiest veg possible. So as Martin said, the cosmetic standards that are put up there by supermarkets means that farmers have to use tons of pesticides to keep all the fruit and veg looking perfect. So if your supermarket does do a range of wonky veg, which most do, to try and buy them, buy local seasonal vegetables, buy organic if you can, if you can access it and if you can afford it. Don't buy pesticide products and don't use pesticides in your garden or window box or allotment or whatever green space you might have access to. 
Um, and then we do, we provide e-actions online. So we have e-actions at the moment where you can ask your supermarket to stop selling pesticide products. So think about taking one of those actions or, or sharing it. Just leave that up there for a second. This is a quick Rachel Carson quote. How could intelligent beings seek to control a few unwanted species by a method that contaminated the entire environment and brought the threat of disease and death even to their own kind? move on oh there we go sorry um this is our flagship publication so we produce this every year it's called the dirty dozen and basically what we do is there's something called the expert committee on pesticide residues in food which is a government agency and they do actually a relatively pathetic amount of testing they test 3,000 kilograms of food every year in total and they publish data on uh, which types of fruit and veg and other produce has the highest levels of pesticide residues. And what we do is we take their data, which is produced in a very unfriendly way, which nobody, most people won't look at. We have a lot of fun looking at it, but most people will be put off. Um, and we take it, we analyze it, and we publish into this handy list. And the idea is that people can take it shopping with them. And it's to help people who can't afford or access a fully organic diet to avoid produce which are most likely to contain multiple residues. And what we do is we focus on, on multiple residues, so otherwise known as pesticide cocktails. And that's because actually safety levels, so residue levels are set for just one pesticide at a time. But there's an increasing amount of evidence which shows that actually pesticides can combine together to be more harmful. Um, so what you can do is you can download this list, you can share it and you can take it shopping with you. Um, so for example, you know, you might want to prioritize buying, you know, organic, uh, for example, organic herbs, which are very high on the list. Just another quick Rachel Carson quote, which rings true today. It's also an era dominated by industry in which the right to make a dollar at whatever cost is seldom challenged. So I think that still stands pretty true. Uh, this is our guide to gardening without pesticides. So it's organized by pest. Um, there are 22 million gardens in the UK, and if you add them together in parks and road verges and other green spaces, you could form an amazing network of wildlife friendly habitats if they were chemicals free. So what you can do is you can download the guide, use it to help you stop using pesticides in your garden or allotment or window box, share it with your friends. Um, and you can also then consider showing off to everybody by printing off this poster and laminating it and sticking it in your window to advertise the fact that your garden is a pesticide free zone. Another Rachel Carson quote, in an age where man has forgotten his origins and is blind even to his most essential needs for survival, water along with other resources has become the victim of indifference. So the third way that you can get involved is our pesticide free towns campaign. So this launched in 2015 and it aims to end urban pesticide use by local, by local councils who are actually the largest users of pesticides outside of agriculture. So this is something I actually didn't know until I took this job that pesticides were sprayed in urban spaces. They're sprayed in parks and green spaces, on pavements, playgrounds, unbelievably children's playgrounds, around schools, hospitals and shopping centers and housing estates. The, act, the active substances used, so the chemicals used, they include possible carcinogens and endocrine disruptors that mess with hormone systems. They also include groundwater con contaminants and bee toxins. And they sort of perpetuate this kind of neat and tidy mindset in the UK, which really threatens urban biodiversity. I mean, you could argue that a weed is just a plant in the wrong place. Um, so we really want to, it's not about swapping a like for like, it's not about saying, okay, we're not going to get rid of everything with pesticides, we're going to use an alternative. It's also about leaving some of these plants in the ground and allowing them to be habitat. So although urban pesticide use is only 5% by volume, it's actually the second main route of exposure to pesticides after residues in diet, because we're such an urban population. So it has no implications for food security. So all the arguments that the pesticide industry likes to say that we're all going to starve if we're not you know, they've been disproven anyway, but actually these don't even apply in urban spaces. Um, almost all of the use in the UK is herbicides used to control weeds. It's mostly cosmetic, so a little bit for invasive species like Japanese knotweed. But even then, you shouldn't be spraying it. You can do stem injection straight into the root, which stops it kind of leaching out into water and, and soil. Um, but it's almost all cosmetic. And the largest active by far is glyphosate, more than three quarters. And that was re-approved by the EU in 2017, but with advice to minimize its use in public spaces because of its concern over its impact on human health. And this is something forgotten or unknown by most, most councils. 
There are lots of non-chemical alternatives available from hot foam, brushes. Um, you can see here, we've got two guides, one for a, a, the general guide and one um, a guide for the amenity sector and, and alternatives, loads of alternatives available. France banned all non-agricultural non -agricultural pesticides in 2019. So the only person in France who can buy pest and use pesticides now are licensed farmers. And lots of towns across the UK have already gone pesticide free while others have signed up to our three year phase out plan. So far around hundred local authorities have taken action and our ultimate aim is to flip enough to ultimately get a nationwide ban. Um, so we work directly with councils. We help them to draft their pesticide policies, write council motions, advise them, advise them on designing trials of non-chemical alternatives. But we're a small team. So really at the core of the Pesticide Free Towns campaign is about mobilizing local residents to take action and hold their council to account. So here are just a few of the logos of Pesticide Free Towns campaigns across the UK. We're running in around 120 locations. Here are some of them. Each campaign is different depending on the local context, the personality of the campaigners, what's required to shift the council. Uh, we support campaigners via online catch-ups, which connect campaigners up with each other to share learnings and inspire each other. We have a regular newsletter, very active Facebook group just for campaigners, and we provide advice and expertise when needed. So what you can do, um, there's a map on our website. You can check and see if there is an active campaign in your area. Um, you can see if your area is already pesticide free, if you're lucky enough to live, to live in one like I am in Brighton and Hove. Um, if there's not, if there is a campaign in your area, we can connect you with the people working on this issue already. If not, we could help you start one. Um, you can write to your council to see what pesticides they're using at the moment. And there's um, local elections on the 5th of May, which are a really brilliant opportunity to get candidates to make promises in this area. It's a tactic we've used quite a lot, quite successfully. So I know there are London-wide London uh, elections and you can check in your area, maybe attend an environmental hustings, ask, an, ask a question about pesticides. It's, it's actually a really easy win um, in terms of lots of councils now have biodiversity commitments and things like that, but are sort of looking for what to do and going pesticide free using our three-year phase out plan is a really easy win for them. So just to finish up, oh, a final Rachel quote, sorry. The question is whether any civilization can wage relentless war on life without destroying itself and without losing the right to be called civilized. So finally, we also work at the national level. We work very closely actually with Martin and, and Steph at the national level. Since 2016, we've mostly focused on uh, the threats and opportunities created by Brexit. So threats, we're doing a lot of work on trade deals, trade deals with countries like Australia with weaker standards than us. Quite nervous about the Brexit Freedoms Bill, the government pushing through kind of a trashing of our current pesticide standards, and then opportunities around better support for farmers, a better subsidy system which pays farmers like Martin and John for working hard to reduce their pesticide use. So in terms of that area for work, it's much more of a top-down approach. So really we do a lot of e-actions to MPs and ministers so you can sign up to our mailing list to receive them and find out how to take action. And that's me. Brilliant, thanks so much, JC. Really clear and interesting presentation there. Um, so um, we've got a couple of questions coming in on the chat. So we'll go to those first and give everybody else a chance to, to think of any if they have any. Um, so there's a question um, from another Martin. Um, to John, I don't know if you can see the question there, John. Um, so essentially, does putting more than one type of crop in the same field together make it more difficult to plan an effective rotation that wipes out pests successfully without giving pests somewhere to hang on? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. What, what actually happens, um, it, it actually, as we increasingly grow uh, more sort of multi-species sort of crops, um, is that it sort of turns the rotation on its head and it sort of, it sort of negates the 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 need for a rotation um, because you know it it it, it turns into a sort of a much more sort of complex thing on an annual basis. And the reason why we have a rotation is because it's designed around growing monocultures. So if you stop growing monocultures, um, it does sort of flip that uh, rotation. But we're at the beginning of this journey. So, um, but that's what we're discovering um, in, in the limited amount of time that we've been. Uh, doing it and they he also asked the the questions about um harvesting the crops together there's two really interesting things that happens when when different plants are competing uh, to essentially uh, reproduce and set seed 
uh, when they're competing against each other, their harvest dates tend to sort of level up. So normally beans would be harvested after wheat, uh, maybe one or even two weeks. But we found actually when they're grown together, they actually come together. Um, and so harvesting them isn't uh, a problem. The only thing we do have to do after that is to separate them, but it's a relatively easy job because the bean seed is much bigger than the wheat seed. And so you can just put the beans through a sieve, the wheat, you know, uh, the, the wheat falls through the sieves and the beans stay on top. But nowadays you've got lots of lovely, you know, technical things like color separators. So uh, color separators are, are, are tables where they can note the different color of the different seeds and knock them out of the sample. So um, yeah, sort of more, more, um, more technology needed in that area, but th these are all solvable things. And, you know, growing more than one, one species in a field, I think is a key way of trying to replicate nature and, and also sort of get more product productivity out of our fields at the same time, supporting um, insects and pollinators um, and soil health. Great, thanks, John. Um, slightly, uh, just to follow on from that, slightly different to um, uh, wheat and bean in the same field. I don't know, Martin, if you um, wanted to say anything about the agroforestry at, at Hope Farm, just thinking about the other way of kind of using the same field to grow multiple different types of crop and, and the use and how useful that is. Yeah, I, and it's gone really touched on it. We have had a system of monoculture across a wide landscape for far too long. Um, and we need to add that diversity back. So at, at the OSPB Hope Farm, like many other places now, they're doing avenues of trees and agroforestry and, and John's doing similar. And it's bringing that diversity of species, plants, cropping within the landscape. So you're not just getting a cereal crop that's grown in between the avenues of trees, but you're also getting a fruit or a nut crop or a, wood, a timber product in future years. And it's... We've got to start really understanding the diversity we want to produce from the landscape. Nature doesn't do single things. If you look at anywhere in nature, it is never just one plant. And that's what we can do through, through agroforestry and through biodiversity strips, combined companion crops, joined up crops. But we need to learn how to do that. And for, unfortunately, the, ind the industry as a whole hasn't been leading on that. And it hasn't really helped farmers swap knowledge and exchange. Lots is going into it now, but farmers are sometimes leaving the research because farmers are actually wanting to get on with it. And there's ma many amazing farmers like the RSPB's farm, like John's farm and many others who are just getting on with it and make trying to find their own solutions and then are willing to spend their time sharing that information to others, which I think is a really positive future of what we can achieve. Can I, can I just make a very quick yeah. comment there? I completely agree with Martin. And, um, you know, even though, you know, we don't use any pesticides, um, it's, a, it's a big leap uh, for most farmers to go from, you know, something, you know, they've been brought up and taught at agricultural college or wherever it is, uh, that this is the way forward and this is the only way you can do it. And the wonderful thing about Martin's work is that um, he's reducing his pesticides but, uh, uh, and, 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 and building his soil health, but also he, it's not a, it's a complete cut-off thing. It's something that farmers who want to make a transition um, can recognise. And um, even though, you know, I, I believe we shouldn't be using any pesticides in our farming systems, um, you know, we need to appeal to the sort of the, the, the wider uh, 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 farming uh, population and the work that Martin does uh, completely does that so um, yeah big respect great thank you both um so question for josie um josie how does um, uk produce compare to imported products in the dirty dozen yeah that's a really good question i mean the problem is that the testing <laughs> is so kind of haphazard and random that it's very difficult to kind of uh, to understand trends and see trends. In fact, I, I think partly that's why they do it. So for example, strawberries will be high up for two years in a row and then next year won't be tested. So it, it seems um, that's something we're campaigning for, which is a much better testing regime. I mean, theoretically imports are supposed to meet the same standards as, as uh, UK produce. So 
you know, someone from DEFRA might argue that they're very similar. But as I say, the testing regime is so rubbish and we suspect the testing at the ports isn't really happening either, to be honest. Plus, you've got things like animal feed, for example, which isn't tested at all and doesn't even have safety limits for pesticides. So um, it's hard to kind of make a generalization. Plus, then obviously with imported stuff, you've got all the problems around food miles and then you have to use more fungicides if, if the supply chains are long. So in general, I would say that UK produce is better, but it is impossible to tell that from the data published by the government, I'm afraid. Great, thank you. Mm. <laughs> Depressing, but thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so um, question for anyone from Gabby about um, deworming chemicals. I'm not sure we necessarily have a particular expert on this, although anyone feel free to, to jump in. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. Gabby, that um, veterinary pharmaceuticals in livestock are a really big problem for um, biodiversity. Um, yeah, you obviously mentioned the dung bill and soil invertebrates, and then obviously, you know, the birds that feed on those as well. I think, you know, it's massively implicated, for example, in the big decline of uh, chuff um, in Scotland and, you know, many other species as well. So absolutely, it's an issue. Um, I don't think we would have anyone here that could make any specific organic treatment recommendations, but if anyone does want to comment on it, Please go ahead, Martin. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to say it. Not just livestock, pets as well. We're yeah. over-treating. We use it as a recreational treat. So even people's pack, uh, um, cats and dogs, that is having an effect on our landscape as well. What we need to be doing is uh, many of these uh, wormers really have massive effect to dung beetles and other, other things. And then that natural process of how the manures get into the ground. So we should be checking the livestock for, for, for uh, eggs and pests and, and making an educated uh, or, uh, you know, research that is that animal suffering? Has it got a problem? Does it need treating? Rather than the system most farmers are in now, it's an annual treatment or many times a year just because they've done it in the past or they advise that that's the period they should do it. So I think many farmers are already questioning the what they've done in the past and are moving away and seeing real health benefits to the livestock and their landscape. The, the, the only thing I would add is that, um, you know, organically we, want, we run a clean grazing system. And so we make sure that animals don't go back on land um, uh, during, during a specific, specific times of the life cycle of the worms. Uh, and so that's really important, but then it comes down to more extensive grazing. Um, which is better for the soil and better for the animal. Uh, but that's certainly one way uh, it, in farming, how you can get around using wormers. Thank you. And of course, flea treatments on the back necks of cats and dogs as well is a really big problem. There's um, quite a lot of work looking at um, how pesticides that have been banned in agriculture, neonicotinoid pesticides that have been banned in agriculture are still full, uh, still in all of our rivers because it's the same chemical that's used for flea treatment for pet cats and dogs. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely work to do to stop using these things so, well, so prophylactically. So just, you wouldn't treat humans <laughs> medically in that way. So um, we probably need to stop doing that with pets, but also, um, you know, if you are a, a dog owner in particular, it's probably worth um, doing some research as to, you know, the best type of flea treatment um, and, you know, for example, not allowing your dog to swim in a in a river once they've just had the, the flea treatment applied and that kind of thing. So, yeah, there are things that pet owners can do, definitely. Um, OK, so there's quite a few similar questions around um, labelling of organic versus non-organic um, and you're absolutely right, uh, Claire, at the moment, there's predominantly there's it's either organic or it's not. Um, there is, uh, you know, what, what we need is essentially a, an accreditation scheme that 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 shows something has been grown in a wildlife friendly way. Um, and there's something called Fair to Nature, um, which which does that. Um, but it's not. Uh, so, so do look out for anything that says fair to nature in your supermarket, but um, it's not very widespread at the moment, um, but we're hoping that that will get bigger. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if Martin or John want to comment on the kind of labelling of organic versus non-organic at all. I mean, the, well, the only thing I would say is that um, it, 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 when, you, when you buy something organic, you know, the, the regulation um, that applies to our farming system is, is, is governed by a UK and European law. We're inspected uh, once a year and can be spot inspected by anyone to make sure that we are doing exactly what we should be doing. 
Um, so if you buy organic, um, it really is what it says on the tin. The difficulty uh, I think um, that you have with the other, the, the Fair to Nature brand is actually what does it mean? Are the farms being inspected? What are they actually doing? Are they really um, traveling in a direction they're supposed to be traveling in? Because there's no inspection, it's not governed by law. Uh, and I think that's a really important difference. I welcome completely um, those kind of initiatives, but sometimes I question, um, you know, uh, you know what, what, what actually is it you're buying? Um, you know, uh, uh, what, what regulates those farmers? So I'll give a little bit of defence to Fair to Nature because they do come out and inspect and check and give you advice on biodiversity matrix improvements. Um, but it's not like organic where it's fully set in stone uh, and it's you know there's no black and white. Um, and it's really hard for the consumers to buy food that they, they, they want to connect with farmers doing the right thing. There's a campaign for clear labelling at the moment, um, and we might be able to try and share some details around that, to try and get the government to make sure there's a clear labelling system. And it doesn't mean about putting all loads of information in, but some honesty and truth within the system and labels. We're seeing many supermarkets and major supply chains claim wonderful things, but really deliver very little. So we need to perhaps be able to help the consumer to identify produce, either organic or high animal welfare or doing the right thing for the landscape compared with products that aren't. Because we need society to engage, to drive the market. And it goes, picks up a point around some organic produce being too expensive for some consumers. If we can make it broader, we'll actually all, we can lower the cost of some organic because we're all making better out of the system. Um, and there's no us and them, and they're on a different production system and their costs are different. So I do think there's a huge opportunity if we can get this labelling right and the consumer can understand where they get it from. But always, if you've got a farm shop or can know the farmer, uh, trust and relationship with your supply chain. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Um, and um, Shelley in the chat has, um, yeah, just added a little bit more information on Fair to Nature, if anyone wanted to have a look at that. Um, does anyone have any more questions for any of our panellists? I'll give people a, a minute to think. I think the, uh, the um, cost of organicism is a really, a really good question. Obviously, you know, an entirely organic diet is unaffordable for the vast majority of people and obviously you know a lot of the work that, that pan and rspb and, and martin and others are doing is you know is working with government at, at that level to make sure that all farmers across the board are supported to be farming um in a much more nature friendly way um can i can i make a comment about the cost um you're, you're absolutely right in in some cases um organic food does cost more uh, the difficulty is the organic sector is still a very small percentage in this country, which means that there is a, a very little research and development that goes into uh, farming in an organic way or even a more nature friendly way. Now, if we switched uh, the amount of research and development that we currently put into uh, pesticide usage, and you can imagine there would be a revolution of the way that we grow our crops uh, in this country, which would mean um, productivity would go up and prices would come down. And the difficulty I have always had is that they are, there are pretty much no NGOs like the RSPB, like the Wildlife Trust, who actually come out and actually champion organic as something that people should be heading towards to encourage that kind of research and development we need, to encourage people to be brave to farm without pesticides. Because until we do that, it is going to be more expensive because we just have no research and development put into it. And it's an incredibly important point. Um, so, you know, let's let's, you know, get behind it and, and make those changes and then costs will come down. Thanks, John. Jason, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I actually wanted to ask John a question, because I think um, the reason NGOs don't advocate it is because it's a bit chicken and egg, isn't it? It's because huge amount, amounts of people can't afford it. So then. Do you, do you think that the price could be brought down through subsidies? Like if the government did genuinely kind of realign subsidies from, from funding bad forms of agriculture dependent on inputs and, and realigned that towards organic and, and better farming with nature, do you think that could bridge the gap? 
I, I think, you know, kickstart starting these things with some kind of um, help uh, from the government uh, uh, always works. And, and um, you know, it, they, they have done it with uh, or, uh, organics to a certain extent. Um, the difficulty is, is that um, when you, um, you know, subsidize it by too much, then of course it distorts the market. And we've seen it in the organic market where, you know, a huge amount of Welsh farmers were given a, a large amount of money to convert large tracts of wells to, to organic production and suddenly the, you know the 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 the, um, sh the lamb market price just dropped through the floor um i i think it's got to come from uh consumers it's got to come from the market and um it, and it's got to be driven by people who, who have that that sort of kind of power behind the consumers and that is people like the rspb and those um sort of nature you know, friendly NGOs, um, you've got to be driving it. Um, and you've got to be telling your customers, uh, you know, what they should be buying. You know, at the end of the day, um, you know, our bird population over the last 20 years is has just, not only do we have more, many more species of birds than we had when we were farming non-organic, but, but more numbers within those species. And so, you know, pe people like the RSPB should be absolutely shouting to the rooftops about um, organic farming, um, but they don't. Good challenge there, John. Thank you. So um, I think Can that... I, sorry, I just add a, add a point to that, really. Yeah, go for it, Martin. Is it organic foods too expensive or is it we're not paying the true cost of food and the damage our current food system does to our landscape, environment, watercourses, society and everything else? I actually think the dam we're not paying for the damage caused by our food system. When it's organic, we know... You know, has a lot better biodiversity footprint, soil health, bird numbers, and we're not paying for the damage we're causing by cheap systems and food. And I do understand that there are parts of society that can't afford uh, to pay more for food. That isn't a cheap food problem. That's a society uh, issue around supporting society to eat a healthy diet and have the affordability to eat well. So I always reckon we really should have clear standards to stop the harmful food productions and you know, encourage everybody to remove pesticides from the landscape because then we're all on the same playing field and we're all paying for the true impact of our food production on not just the UK footprint, but our global footprint. So I just think, I don't think it's organic too expensive. I think other stuff's too cheap and we're not covering the cost of the harm that we do. I, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with that, Martin. Um, but as an organic farmer, I've just had you know, the uh, too expensive thing thrown at me the whole time. And I'm sort of slightly wary of the argument, which is a lot why uh, we've got to try and find an argument about, um, uh, you know, making food still affordable, uh, but actually getting uh, more productive, you know, farming from nature based friendly farming. Great, thank you. So we, we've got a question come in from Neil about the ELM scheme. So for those that don't know, the ELM scheme is environmental land management scheme which is the the government are currently developing a new farming subsidy scheme outside of the eu um and the question is is the new elm scheme a move in the right direction regarding pesticide reduction so we didn't hear a lot of both negative and positive comments from farmers um there's probably a lot we could say on elm scheme probably worth keeping it to the subject of pesticides for the, for the purposes of this uh, webinar um although very happy to to chat further afterwards um so in terms of in terms of pesticides um really we don't know um there's a huge amount of potential um as has sort of been highlighted in you know in this discussion about you know what what good it could do to set farmers on, you know, off on a route to reduce their reliance on pesticides and, you know, work with nature and, and all of that kind of thing. And, and we do know that George Eustace, the Secretary of State, is very keen on integrated pest management. Um, and the government have committed to an integrated pest management standard um, as part of the new ELM scheme. Um, so, we, you know, we, we know that, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, government talks, uh, talks now about, um, you know, the need for supporting farmers to you know use alternatives and things so in a way that, that the noise is coming are quite encouraging um but it's quite difficult because it's a lot of the detail has so far been lacking um so you know one of the things we're working really hard with you know martin and others and on you know a trying to work out exactly what is being discussed for these standards but also sort of trying to support so that they they lead to a meaningful reduction in pesticide use and you know, meaningful support for farmers to 
to you know increase nature on their farms so it's a sort of watch and see but we're working really hard on it might be a summary but martin i don't know if you have anything to add yeah just one it's not a subsidy uh it's a sorry payment sorry sorry action. payment for um, yeah. or, or payment for an area and yeah. we'll move into a public money for public goods yeah. so the public yeah. will support action on farmers now, i think it's a positive direction what yeah. i find really yeah. negative yes we've got uh, a standard for uh, integrated pest management but they're not supporting organic until 24 or 25 so where is the priority of driving a better farming system, rewarding organic farming systems right up the front? And that's what I really struggle with. We know Secretary of State is very interested and wants to support regenerative farming systems, but you've got all that inorganic system anyway. So why isn't that front and centre in what we want to deliver in the future? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, John or JC wanted to add anything? I, I just wanted to say what he said. Yeah, great. <laughs> okay, so we've got one more, another question from the other Martin. Um, it's probably one for you, Martin L. Um, encouraged by the development of technology for selectively spraying. Um, yes, yeah, so this, this is a yeah, this is a question about um, whether I guess precision technology and new types of technology can help. Um. Huge amount of technology is coming uh, where we can go to individual plants and treatments and bits and pieces. But do we still want to be using the products? Shouldn't we not make the system and the rotation and everything else move away from that treatment? Um, while I can see a lot of benefit in some systems for the robotics and individual weeding and bits, we really want to be trying to move away from the products to a system that doesn't need that interve intervention. So while I'm very supportive in, in technology, and I think there's some great opportunities for it, but we also just need to understand the risk that may come to far making farmers go in a, in a direction that not removing the problems we currently have. Um, I think as well, it links back to a point that, that John made about the lack of research and development into organic techniques and other nature friendly farming techniques, because, you know, new technology is very exciting um, and the government's very keen on it and industry is very keen on developing it and, you know, we're living in a in a world that's getting increasingly reliant on technology and so it's much more appealing um for funding and for directing kind of money towards it whereas actually you know rspb and uh, wildlife trust and others are you know we're massively advocating to for you know research and development funding to go towards this kind of regenerative agriculture and agroecological techniques which are kind of ways of well, exactly what Martin and John do on a day to day basis, which is, you know, working with nature and having a much more sustainable farming system. And if the if the if the enthusiasm and the research funding um, went to more of those techniques, then, you know, we stand a much better chance of moving away from the products altogether. So it, it feels like there's a place for technology, but it but it potentially is acting as a little bit of a distraction at the moment from actually fixing the kind of fundamental problems as to why we are relying so much on the chemicals in the first place. So it's 20 to 8, so I definitely don't want to overrun on an evening. Um, if any of our speakers would like to say a final thing, um, please do feel free. Otherwise, I will wrap up. Put your hand up if you'd like to. No pressure. Martin. I just, yeah, I, I really want to get in. The, so like my own farming system, it was only till a couple of years ago when my father uh, passed away. That left me the opportunity to do things differently like many of us have huge pressure from uh, peers and families and other things to carry on farming the way we are. And I hope society and members of the public and organizations can really help farmers transition and show the, the leadership that's needed in making that transitional change over the next few years. Because there is some real opportunities. We've, I've been around John's, um, around John's farm. It's amazing. Hey, he's used lots of technology, really good systems, sharing lots of it. We can do so much better and together I think we can. Yeah, thank you. John? Uh, I've, I've, I've um, already said lovely things about Martin because he's a lovely man uh, and I feel I've been slightly critical over some of the NGOs about not support for organic farming but what I, what I would like to say is that um, you know you know, you guys, the RSBB, we work a lot with the Suffolk Wildlife Trust, have been sort of campaigning for uh, nature and for a better environment. 
and we ride in your coattails. We sit on your shoulders. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, but but yes, but just you know, remember we're out there and support us when you can. Brilliant. Thanks, John. JC. Yeah, just to say, I think um, for decades it's sort of suited the pesticide industry and others to present it as kind of farmers versus the environmental movement. And I'm just so happy to kind of move away from that approach where actually we're all on the same side and it is it's society and the environmental movement and farmers versus an industry that puts profit amongst, you know, above all else. So the more we can get together and be on the same page, I think we actually have a chance of sort of cracking this thing. Brilliant. Really uh, great comment to finish on there, JC. Thank you. OK, so um, thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Um, I found that a really interesting, stimulating discussion. I um, hope you enjoyed it. Um, I will, um, will, you'll be receiving a kind of follow up email for anyone that signed up via the Eventbrite link, um, including links to the previous um, webinars as well, if you wanted to catch up on any of those. Um, and yeah, um, do get in touch. I will put my email address in the chat now. Do get in touch if you had any further questions that you uh, weren't able to ask at the mo um, uh, at the time and um, thank you very much everybody have a lovely evening and thank you so much to all of our speakers thank you thank bye, you so everybody. much bye thank you